Church of Abundance. It's Sunday morning, just gone 10 a.m. And we have been listening to Wash Away. It's a Creative Commons license. Wash Away. Wash away. Thank you for joining Pastor France and the Church of Abundance. Father God, may you guide and help us in our studies on church history today. Let's look at the Baptists, a trail of blood. Did you know that there are close to 1.5 billion Roman Catholics in the world today? Does that make them right? I myself have embraced Catholic ideals for close to a quarter of a century? The answer is no. The reason is that they have broken away from the preserved word of God and followed other doctrines, pagan doctrines, and church traditions. In fact, they have been instrumental in perverting the holy scriptures with the perverted translations and by adding the books of the Apocrypha. Thank you that we have the preserved word of God in the King James Version, the authorized version of the Bible today. Remember that the devil and the devils that came down from heaven will do anything 
to lead us from the truth of Jesus Christ and of God. Remember that the devil is the God of this world, and the gods in this world are his devils or the fallen angels. If you worship any pagan deity, any deity other than the one and only almighty God, then be warned, because you now know exactly who you are worshipping. Let's look at the Queen of Heaven. Did you ever question why the Catholic Church has declared Jesus Christ's earthly mother to be the Queen of Heaven and our Redemptrix? Now, the Queen of Heaven is mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 18. But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. If you look at John chapter 3, verse 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, just to keep in mind, no man by himself has ascended up to heaven, unless God has taken him up to heaven himself. That has happened in the book, in the Bible. I think there's two or three occurrences of that actually happening. Are we to worship the Queen of Heaven and likewise suffer these curses? We have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. The Queen of Heaven is none other then a pagan goddess comes from the Egyptian gods and goddesses, from the ancient Greek and the ancient Roman, the queen of heaven. That's where she comes from. Are we prepared to lose our faith, to apostatize our beliefs, so that we can worship the pagan Mary, queen of heaven? I hope your answer is no. Now, what happened to the second commandment? If you are a Catholic or you have a Roman Catholic background, then tell me what is the second commandment? You are likely to say something like, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, in actual fact, this is the third commandment. The second commandment was removed from the Catholic Bible, and the tenth commandment was split into two, so that there are still ten commandments. Because of this, idolatry and the cult of Mary are acceptable in the Roman Catholic Church, but are recognized as very bad sin by the rest of Christianity or by real Christians. Now let's look at the Roman Catholic Ten Commandments. One, I am the Lord your God, ye shall not have strange gods before me. Two, ye shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Three, remember to keep holy the Lord's day. Four, honor your father and your mother. Five, you shall not kill. Six, you shall not commit adultery. Seven, you shall not steal. Eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And ten, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. 
Notice how the ninth and tenth commandments are both the same commandment. Thou shalt not covet. It's just been split into two. Now let's look at an example of the Christian Ten Commandments. Unfortunately, this isn't from the King James Version of the Bible, but I think you'll get the idea here. Yeah? You shall make no idols was missing from the Roman Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. And this is exactly why you will find idols in the Roman Catholic Church, statues of Mary, and etc. And people feel quite free to give, um, to spend a lot of time in prayer in front of these statues and idols of, of various types. Now, the Ten Commandments, a typical Christian way of interpreting the Ten Commandments. One, you shall have no other gods before me. Two, you shall make no idols. And in the picture on the left-hand side, you may see a, a calf or a cow. It's symbolizing the golden calf. It's a story that happened in Exodus where the Israelites worshipped the golden calf. And of course, many of them were put to death by God because of this iniquity, this sin. You shall make no idols. It's missing from the Roman Catholic Ten Commandments. Ye shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. Now, just a little bit about the fourth commandment. A lot of people trip over that. Keep the Sabbath day holy. I'd like to do a little study about that because that was something that was specifically for the Jews at that time. It doesn't really apply to the Gentiles as such. Now, although there are some Gentiles who actually keep the Sabbath day, but it's, it's not a sin to keep the Sabbath day. Uh, it's basically from 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Friday night to 6 p.m. Saturday night, because they count the days from about 6 p.m. to the next 6 p.m. instead of from midnight or midday to midday. So, so that's the way they do it. Christians have what we call the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. So we celebrate going to church and doing our prayers in that on the Lord's Day. It is not wrong to keep the Sabbath day holy as well, but it is not required. I hope that makes sense. Persecuting Baptists from when Jesus Christ was alive. First, the pagan Roman Empire persecuted the Christians bitterly. Jesus Christ himself was crucified by the Roman Empire and by the Jews at the time. Then the Holy Roman Empire took over when the Roman Empire started faulting, and the Holy Roman Empire has continued the persecution up until the present day. The Holy Roman Empire, or as some people say, the unholy Roman Empire is nothing else than the Roman Catholic Church. There is very likely an embassy for the Holy Roman Empire in your very suburb. Or we, you could think of it rather as a local Roman Catholic Church and I'm sure there's one in your neighborhood or nearby. After the death of Jesus Christ, there were no Jews. Large numbers of the Jews had become Christians. There was just a remnant of the Hebrews of the Jews left who had rejected the Messiah. Those early Christians were almost all Jewish. Then the Gentiles were allowed into the fold by Jesus Christ himself. This is why we can be 
Christians today because of Jesus Christ. There was a long period of time spanning many decades before the remnant of the Jews who had rejected their Messiah, in other words, they rejected Jesus Christ, regrouped and called themselves Hebrews. The descendants of these people are what we call the Jews today. Remember that they are still God's chosen people, and they always will be, just as we are Gentiles, and we always will be Gentiles or non-Jews. God deals with the Gentiles differently to the Jews. The covenants that God made with the Jews were not for us, but solely for the Jews. God has made other provisions for us Gentiles in heaven. We should drill down into that to get a bit more clarity around that. Persecuted for 2,000 years. Can you believe the Baptists were persecuted for so much, such a long period of time? We are talking today about the way that the Baptists have been tortured and persecuted for being Bible-believing Christians for nearly 2,000 years, all the way from when John the Baptist was calling people in the wilderness in the River Jordan to repent of their sins and be baptized. We are looking at how the Baptists or the true churches have come through all this time and are still, praise be to God, able to proclaim the pure truth about Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God 2,000 years later. If you join us, you run the danger of being punished for becoming a Bible-believing Christian, because that's what we are. We are independent Baptists. We are Bible-believing Christians. Are you prepared to become a Bible-believing Christian? The sect known as the Anabaptists came to prominence at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Although they are known to have been in existence long before that time, a study of the history of the Anabaptists shows them to be the connecting link between the ancient and medieval Baptists and the modern Baptists. The name Anabaptist means rebaptizer, and is a title given to this ancient group of Baptists by the enemies because of their practice of rebaptizing all who came into their ranks from the Catholic Church. The Anabaptist has always been a title of slander and reproach. The Baptists themselves would not accept this name because they counted all Catholic and later on Protestant baptism to be unscriptural. Amen. Thereby contending that there could be no rebaptism, for there had been no true baptism at all. Baptists of the Reformation era were called by a variety of names other than Anabaptist or Wiedertaufe in German. Some of these were Catabaptists, meaning literally down dippers or immersionists. immersionists. They were also known as Neodonatists, relating the Anabaptists back to the Donatists of the fourth century. In this chart, history is seen to repeat itself. The Donatists were to the rapidly expanding Catholic Church what the Anabaptists were to the newly formed Protestant churches, and that is a thorn in the side. Amen.
thank you that we can be a thorn in the side of the Protestants and the Catholics. A word here may be necessary as to the proper name of this interesting group of people. Were they Baptists or were they Anabaptists? They are commonly categorized as Anabaptists by friends and foes. Yet, this name was especially offensive to them, as it charged them with rebaptizing those whom they regarded as unbaptized. And because this name Anabaptist was intended as a stigma, by custom, the most friendly historians call them Anabaptists. Yet many of their candid opponents speak of them as Baptists. The Petrobrasians complained that Peter of Clugny slandered them by calling them Anabaptists. So did their Swiss and German brethren after them. The London Confession in 1646 protests that the English Baptists were commonly, though unjustly, called Anabaptists. Blackwood, in 1645, complains of being nicknamed Anabaptists. We deny your title. Anabaptism signifies baptism again. Our consciences are fully satisfied with one baptism. We are, if we must needs be new named, anti pedo baptists or cato pedo baptists but not Anabaptists. Baptists now refuse to be called Anabaptists. And for the same reasons, respect for ourselves and for our ancestry demands that the offensive title be thrown aside. And it is not used in this work excepting in quotations. Neither we nor our fathers can probably be named Anabaptists. And to use the term is simply to accept a misleading nickname pinned upon us in contempt. Now that comes from A History of the Baptists by Thomas Armitage, who lived between 1819 and 1896. The Donatists were slandered by their supposed connection with the fanatical circumvalians, just as the Anabaptists were connected by their enemies with the unfortunate Munster Rebellion. The Anabaptist pastors were often identified through their practice of carrying canes or staffs, a custom which was in contrast to the sword and bishop's crook held by the hand of the establishment church clergy. Now you may ask, why were the church clergy, the Roman, the Catholic clergy, walking around with swords? The term stabler or staff carrier became synonymous with heretic. They were often identified with the Cathari. The Cathari is a word meaning pure ones, relating to the purity of life and the purity of church practice by Baptists. Even though this term was not new, but had it been applied to true New Testament churches for 1,200 years. The Anabaptists were accused of communism. One of the oft-heard charges against the Anabaptists was that they were communists, apparently due to their communal living. 
a key identifying mark of the Baptists as this at this time was their willingness to live simple lives. And this was in stark contrast to the opulence or the wealth of the Catholic and Protestant clergy and of the Baptists to share their positions, their possessions with their needy brothers and sisters in Christ. They were attacked for practicing a community of goods. They were also slanderously charged with practicing community of wives. As to these charges, Anabaptist leader Julius Lieber stated, as to community of wives, I would say that if anyone teaches that, his doctrine is of the devil and not of God. However, as to community of goods, I am obliged to help the brother near to me out of brotherly love and without being coerced. Anti pedo Baptists. Furthermore, many who held to unsound doctrine and are referred to as Anabaptists were, to be more accurate, anti pedo Baptists, i.e., they rejected infant baptism but not, did not necessarily accept true Bible baptism. Some who were called Anabaptist may have exhibited Docetist tendencies, which is the belief that Jesus Christ's physical body was an illusion, as was his crucifixion. This was said of Menno Simons, who, unskilled in areas of speculative theology, apparently was driven to accept this position during debates with John of Lasco. And let this be a lesson to us. If we are not skilled in theology, don't get into theological debates because you could be forced into a corner, not because you believe that, but because of your lack of knowledge you've been taken advantage of. Luther called the Baptists rotten geister. Luther called them clickmakers, rotten geister because of the threat their beliefs and practices presented to the monolithic church-state system. And this monolithic church-state system was adhered to by the Protestants as much as it was adhered to by the Catholics. However, it must be noted that all who were called Anabaptists were not necessarily true Baptists. The name Anabaptist was a collective term in the day of the Reformation. The practice of branding all non-conformists with the most odious name imaginable was not new. Earlier groups such as the Paulicians and the Albigenses had been marked as many chains by the enemies in an attempt to discredit them. And the same practice was conducted against the Anabaptists. So as a result, you had all manner of people in the so-called camp of Anabaptists. Some of them may have been true Baptists. At the time of the Reformation, Europe was undergoing a dramatic political, social, and religious upheaval. 
there were many who did not conform. Since the term Anabaptist was a particularly detestable one, anybody out of step was likely to be so called. It is therefore important to differentiate the several Anabaptists. It might be reasonable that they be separated into two general categories, social Anabaptists and evangelical Anabaptists. The working classes of Europe. The Anabaptists movement had its roots deep within the working classes of Europe. Thus, it was easy to associate the name with the great peasant uprisings and the social unrest of the times, because those groups of people were full of Baptists. While no one could deny that true Anabaptists were involved in many of these events, such as the role of Baptist patriots in the American Revolution, it is incorrect to ascribe radicalism as a tenet, tenet of Anabaptism. Some of the radicals of that day who were called Anabaptists were, for example, Thomas Munzer and the Zwickai prophets. The fanatical Munzer from 1489 to 1525 was in fact a zealous Lutheran who believed that Luther's Reformation should go much further. He fomented the Peasants Revolt of 1534 to 1535 and was executed in its aftermath. Other men of the same persuasion as Munzer were Hans Hutt, who claimed that a Turkish invasion would end the rule of Rome and usher in Christ's return. And Melchior Hoffmann, who proclaimed the new Jerusalem would be established at Strasbourg in 1533. In hindsight, we know that never happened. The post millennialism and Reconstructionism. Men such as these that we've just mentioned did much harm to the cause of true Baptists. Munzer and his followers were characterized by their claims to receive revelation directly from God in direct opposition of the first great Baptist principle, the sole authority of scripture to be ushering in the millennium in a form of early post millennialism and reconstructionism. In fact, Munzo was strongly opposed to the Baptists. Differing from them, he practiced infant baptism twice a year, christening all born in his congregation. That comes from the historian Armitage. Partly Pelagianism, Unitarianism, and mysticism, Dr. Rule says. He performed a ceremony on baptized persons, which they mistook for baptism, and by which his followers received the designation of Anabaptist. But they taught doctrines fraught with important errors, partly founded of Pelagianism, partly Unitarianism, partly mysticism. The mysticism comes from the fact that he saw visions and he believed that God spoke to him in those visions. And partly impure principles. Veda says that the fanatical outbreaks in South Germany were instigated by Thomas Munzer, who is 
invariably and unfortunately called an Anabaptist. But in reality, he never belonged to the body of Anabaptists, and he was in, strict, in fact strictly opposed to the Baptists. Let's look at the Munster Rebellion. The Munster Rebellion was an attempt by radical so-called Anabaptists to establish a communal theocracy in the German city of Munster. The city became a so-called Anabaptist center from 1534 to 1535 and fell under Anabaptist rule for 18 months. Now that comes from the Wikipedia. And from that writing in the Wikipedia, we get the idea that the common historical teaching in textbooks today is that the Anabaptists caused this horrendous rebellion. Now that is a, a, a portion of the truth that has been propagated and people believe these things, unfortunately. The shameful events which occurred at Minster in Westphalia were the result of years of harsh oppression and terrible suffering received from the hands of Roman Catholic masters. Already a center of Anabaptism, from 1532, the population of the city began to be stirred up through the preaching of the Lutheran Bernhard Tothman. Notice that it's a Lutheran, it's not a, a Baptist. Munster quickly became a city of refuge and a magnet for radicalism. Now, this doesn't sound like, like the Baptist at all. In 1553, a Dutchman named Jan Matthijs proclaimed himself to be Enoch. Can you believe Jan Matthijs proclaimed himself to be Enoch? That was in 1553. And he announced the arrival of the millennial kingdom. In 1534, his companions, John of Leiden and Gert Tom Kloster, took charge of the government of the city. A bloody purge of the old order then began. People were forced to choose between baptism or death. Monasteries were taken and desecrated. The wealth of the city was seized. And an enforced communist system of distribution enacted. Lutherans and Catholics were persecuted. This was a reign of terror akin to the French Revolution. If you go to 1534, Jan Matthijs, following a divine revelation, led 20 men out of the city to attack the armies arrayed against it. He was killed. And that is no surprise. Imagine 20 men walking out to attack all these armies, these large armies around the city. The, the result was obvious. John of Leyden then introduced a theocratic rule. He had himself crowned, and listen to this, as the king of New Jerusalem, that they were under the delusion that they were in the New Jerusalem. So he was crowned as the king of New Jerusalem, John of Leyden. And he lived above the sufferings of his besieged subjects. And then, as though things weren't bad enough, polygamy was introduced. Despite the strong opposition of 200 
two Baptists who were still in the city. And over the dead bodies of 50 of them, polygamy was still introduced. After a year-long siege, the city was retaken by the army of the bishop. Just listen to that. Army of the bishop. The bishop had an army, can you believe? Ending with a horrible massacre of many of its remaining inhabitants and the most revolting torture and execution of the leaders. The enemies of the gospel were quick to associate the Anabaptists with the events of Minster. So in other words, they blamed the Anabaptists for what had happened there. And the effect of this tragedy was to blacken the name of true biblical Baptists for years to come. A wave of persecution against Anabaptists across Europe followed. Let's look at Cardinal Hosius in the Council of Trent. So then, where did the Anabaptists originate? Where did the Baptists come from? Now, we all know that we all come from John the Baptist and from Jesus Christ and the apostles and that first church in Jerusalem. But now this is from the other side, from the Catholic point of view and the Protestant historians, the Catholic historians, because all the Baptist literature and the Baptists themselves were burnt and destroyed. Most church historians would say that they originated at the time of the Reformation. But this is not the case. Cardinal Hosias, a member of the Council of Trent in the year 1560, in an often quoted statement says, if the truth of religion were to be judged by the readiness and boldness of which a man of any sect shows in suffering, then the opinion and persuasion of no sect can be truer and surer than that of the Anabaptist, since there have been none for these 1,200 years past that have been more generally punished or that have more cheerfully or steadfastly undergone and even offered themselves to the most cruel sorts of punishment than these people. And he was talking about the Baptists. Now that comes from Cardinal Hosias, the letters a put opera. That Cardinal Hosias dated the history of the Baptists back 1200 years is obvious in another statement by the Cardinal. The Anabaptists are a pernicious sect, of which kind the Valdensian brethren seem to have been, and have united with the Anabaptists. That comes from Hosias, Works of the Heresies of Our Times, written in 1584. Robert Barclay. Now, Robert Barclay was a Quaker historian, and he said, we shall afterwards show that the rise of the Anabaptists took place prior to the reformation of the Church of England. And there are also reasons for believing that on the continent of Europe, small hidden Christian societies who have held many of the opinions of the Anabaptists have existed from the times of the apostles. In the sense of the direct transmission of divine truth and the true nature of spiritual religion, it seems probable that these churches have a lineage of succession more ancient than that of the Roman church. Amen to that. It just shows you that the Baptists, what we are, our lineage goes all the way back to the days of the apostles. 
We are far more ancient than the Roman church. The death of the Apostle John. Now, if you look in the Presbyterian Edinburgh Encyclopedia or Cyclopedia, it must have already occurred to our readers that the Baptists are the same sect of Christians that were formerly described as Anabaptists. Indeed, this seems to have been their leading principle from the time of Tertullian to the present time. Now, Tertullian was born just 50 years after the death of the Apostle John. And there you have a good example of a Presbyterian encyclopedia providing proof that the Baptists existed from the beginning. Let's listen to a beautiful piece of music, Adeste Fidelis. It's a Creative Commons license, Adeste Fidelis. Let's look at the 
medieval Valdenses. There is ample historical evidence to attest to the fact that the Anabaptists descended from the medieval Valdenses. The Valdenses entered Holland in the year 1182 and by the year 1233. Flanders was full of them, full of them. That comes from J.T. Christian, page 138. Persecutions against the Valdenses of France and Italy in 1332, 1400, and 1478 drove many of their number into Germany, Switzerland, and Bohemia. These scattered Valdenses were the seeds of the Anabaptists. The remnants of the Valdenses in Piedmont united with the Protestants in 1532 and became Peter Baptists. I actually see this as a very sad occasion. They actually compromised the belief. They compromised their faith. The Lutheran historian Johann L. von Mosheim said, Before the rise of Luther and Calvin, they lay concealed in almost all the countries of Europe, particularly in Bohemia, Moravia, Switzerland, and Germany. Many persons who adhered tenaciously to the following doctrine, which the Valdenses, the Wycliffites, and Hussites had maintained, some in a more disguised and others in a more open and public manner. In Germany, large numbers of Valdenses, who were often skilled artisans, found safe haven within the trade guilds, general states. So widely had the sect been scattered that it was said a traveler from Antwerp to Rome could sleep every night in the house of one of their brethren. In Switzerland, the Anabaptists were well established before the Reformation. Zwingli said of them, the institution of Anabaptism is no novelty, but for 300 years has caused great disturbance in the church and has acquired such strength that the attempt in this age to contend with it appears futile for a time. Keep in mind that when Zwingli, one of the great Protestant leaders, was talking about a great disturbance in the church for 300 years, he was still identifying with the Catholic Church. The Council of Zurich was instigated by Zwingli by a public proclamation on St. Andrew's Day in the year 1525. Prohibited rebaptism by punishment without further forgiveness. In other words, they forbade believers' baptism. And this is Zwingli, a, so a Protestant leader. In this mandate, they frankly said to the inhabitants of the district that it's wicked. Anabaptists have proclaimed their doctrines without the permission and consent of the church, declaring that infant baptism is not of God, but has sprung from the devil and therefore ought not to be practiced. They have also invented a rebaptism. And many 
even unlearned in the Holy Scriptures, taken with their vain talk and so far persuaded, have received this brief baptism, esteeming themselves better than other people. Therefore, have we imprisoned and punished for their own good some of the authors of Anabaptism and their disciples, and have twice at their desire ordained conferences or discussions on infant baptism and re-baptism. And notwithstanding that they were all in cases overcome, and some of them have been let go unpunished because they promised to abstain from rebaptism, and others have been banished from our jurisdiction and bounds. Yet have they, disregarding their promise, come again among you and have sown their false doctrine against infant baptism among the simple people. Whence has arisen a new sect of Anabaptists. Therefore we have imprisoned these Baptists and punished their followers for their own good. Folk and Riemann, two Baptist preachers, were condemned to death September the 5th and were taken to the middle of the river Limat and drowned. That comes from the, from the historian Hermitage. Imagine they would took them to the middle of the river and drowned them there for their own good, said Zwingli. Some Protestants mockingly called this the third baptism. Notice it was the Protestants who were calling this the third baptism. At the instigation of Zwingli, the St. Gaul, Switzerland City Council, made another decree on March the 26th in the year 1530 against the most hated Anabaptists. All who adhere to or favor the false sect of the Baptists and who attend hedge meetings shall suffer the most severe punishment. Baptist leaders, their followers, and protectors shall be drowned without mercy. Those, however, who assist them or fail to report or to arrest them shall be punished otherwise on body and goods as injurious and faithless subjects. Now that comes from Armitage. And you thought that Zwingli was such a great Protestant leader. Zwingli wrote a vicious book against the Anabaptists called Elentias Contria Cat Baptistas, or a refutation of the tricks of the Catabaptists or drowners. He called Anabaptists wild asses and other insulting terms and said their immersions were from hell and that the Anabaptists themselves would go to hell. Now that comes from the historian Armitage. Now just to put this in perspective, Zwingli was one of the most respected leaders of the Protestant Reformation. Do we really want to be a Protestant in the line of Zwingli, a Presbyterian? The Rhine River in Bohemia, the Valdenses find natural allies among the Hussites and Bohemian brethren. Martin Luther said that the Anabaptists were Hussites. Valdensian strongholds were to be found throughout Europe in cities such as Cologne, 
Strasbourg and Zurich. In fact, all along the Rhine River, also at Metz, Emberg, Altona, and Hamburg. The Valdenses also spread to the Netherlands, Austria, Hungary, and Transylvania. In each of the places where Valdenses settled, Anabaptists were later to be found in great numbers. It is plain to see that the Anabaptists had an apostolic heritage. Amen. They were called Christians in the first century, and they are referred to in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26. And that's who we are. We come from that line. Montanists. Novatians, Donatists, Paulicians, Albigenses, Valdenses, Anabaptists, and today, Baptists. We're all Baptists right from the beginning. Do you have the courage to stand up and say that you are a Baptist or an independent Baptist? Do you have that courage? Can you do that? Let's look at the attributes of the so-called Anabaptists, the attributes of the Baptists. The historian A.H. Newman, in his Church History, Volume 2, pages 153 to 156, enumerates the following beliefs practices and characteristics of the Anabaptists. Now remember, this is not what the Anabaptists said they believe in or the things that they do, the things that they practice. This is an independent historian who's looking on from the outside and hopefully objectively making a commentary. And what he had to say was, number one, Christian charity. They were content with what they had. Anabaptists believed in and practiced true brotherly love, willingly sharing their worldly goods with others. Two, regenerate church membership. They insisted that true New Testament churches be composed exclusively of born-again believers. Amen. What a wonderful thing to do. Totally agree. Three, baptism of believers. They rejected so-called infant baptism and stood for the baptism of true believers only. Human comments. The earnestness and vigor of their protest against infant baptism constitutes one of the most marked features of the Anabaptist movement. An Anabaptist statement of faith referred to as the Skleitheim Confession of 1527 says, baptism should be given to all those who have learned repentance and change of life and believe in truth that their sins have been taken away through Christ. Wow, that is so true. They solidly upheld Baptist only baptism. As John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness, repent and be baptized. This is exactly that. Repent of your sins to God or to the public, or wherever you want to, it doesn't matter, but just repent of your sins and be baptized to show that you are now a believer, a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Four, separation of church and state. They regarded the state as an institution outside of and apart from the gospel of Christ, whose authority was to be obeyed in all things lawful, but which had no right to interfere in matters of conscience. Five, liberty of conscience. 
this was a fundamental tenet of the Anabaptists, very similar to our doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. Amen. The sixth point, rejection of the magistracy. Now, Anabaptists refused to serve as magistrates. And this was because in their day, the magistracy was the civil arm of the church, which executed literally its decrees. And obviously that was 99% of the time against the Anabaptists. Rejection of oath-taking. They rejected this practice, yet distinguished between testimony regarding known facts and promises regarding future conduct. Maybe we can learn a lesson from that. Eight, rejection of military service. And I myself was a conscientious objector. I'm 100% with him on that one. The reason most of our Baptist forebears, forebears refused to take up arms was because most wars prior to the 20th century were religious in nature, where force was used to coerce others to conform. In other words, Anabaptists to conform to Catholicism. The Crusades were against the Anabaptists. The military service was to be against themselves. Obviously, they would have rejected it. Nine, the rejection of capital punishment. Since the kind of capital punishment most familiar to the Anabaptists was that carried out against so-called heretics, i.e. against the Anabaptists. In other words, capital punishment for them was Anabaptists being burnt at the stake, drowned in the water, tortured to death in the dungeons. So we can well understand their objections to the so-called perverted capital punishment of the day. The 10th point, the millennial return of Christ. Anabaptists rejected Augustinian theology. Okay, so Augustine was obviously a Catholic. Augustine, through his book, The City of God, laid the foundations for the Church of Rome. So obviously there was a lot of perverted doctrine in that. We're not going to go into it now. That's a good thing to dip down into at some future time. So it was natural for them to be pre-millennial. As noted above, some of the pseudo-Anabaptist fanatics thought they could usher in the millennium themselves. <coughs> For example, in the Munster Rebellion, which we spoke about just now, biblical Anabaptists repudiated and abhorred their excesses, that the excesses of the pseudo Anabaptist fanatics. Point 11 the free will of man. Anabaptists believed a man must either choose or reject Christ as Savior. In other words, you determine for yourself if you will spend all of eternity in conscious suffering in the lake of fire, or if you will spend all of eternity in front of the great white throne of God. It's up to you. Amen. The 12th point, salvation by grace through faith. That is the only way. Salvation by grace, grace through faith. Anabaptists believed that grace received through faith was the great transforming agent whereby the sinner is not simply made to participate in Christ's merits, but enters into the completed union with him. They also insisted upon 
good works as the fruit of salvation, not the cause of it. They would not baptize you without seeing this fruit. Amen to that. So you can't do things according to the law, and you can't be a good person and expect to get into heaven. You accept your salvation by grace through faith, and the fruit of your salvation, of getting closer to God, is that you start to live a good life. It's not the other way around. It doesn't work the other way around. Amen. 13. Christ-like living. Compared to most Catholics and Protestants, the Baptists seem to be ascetics. That's what Newman notes. Great stress was laid on the imitation of Christ in his life of self-denying toil and suffering, and the Anabaptist gloried in being counted worthy to suffer for and with Christ. The idea of earthly comfort and enjoyment, most of them utterly renounced. Luxurious living, personal adornment, social amusements, the accumulation of wealth, nearly all of them regarded as inconsistent with the Christian profession. Thus, they were concerned for separation and keeping standards. Amen. Christ-like living. The 14th point. The Lord's Supper for church members only. Amen. They only admitted baptized believers to the Lord's table. And then not before discipline, and that is church discipline, was rigorously exercised upon the brethren. The Skleitheim Confession mentioned earlier says that all who would drink one draft as a memorial of the poor of the poured blood of Christ should beforehand be united to the one body of Christ. In other words, they should be part of the local church. And to do that, you become part of the local church by baptism, confession of your sins, and baptism. Thus, they at least believed that in order to partake of the communion, the person needed to be a member of a true church, of an Anabaptist church. So at the worst, they practiced closed communion. But I believe the historical evidence shows a very closed stance, closed communion. Now, you may think at first that this is a very bad thing, but in fact, it's a very good approach. If you take communion with unconfessed sin in your life, you bring about a curse upon yourself. And so they cut you out so that only those who have come close to Jesus Christ can take the communion. If you've confessed your sins and you've reconciled yourself to the local church and you take communion, it can be a tremendous blessing. Remember, the communion is only a symbolic, but it's that community, that, that doing it all together, where in the blessing comes. 15. Separation from unbelief. The Anabaptists refused to join hands with other religious parties. Newman notes that they not only refused to join with others in religious acts, but utterly repudiated their right to be regarded as Christians. So in other words, if you were doing things which was, which was outside of the Holy Scriptures, and saying you're Christian and that, they didn't regard you as a Christian because you were outside of their one authority, the Holy Scriptures. 16, cooperation among churches. Now, when conditions made it possible, 
Anabaptist churches cooperated in their common cause for Christ, like, for example, the Valdenses, the Anabaptists were characterized by the itinerant preachers, but of course, they remained local churches. In addition to the above listing, W.A. Gerald cites a paper read before the American Society of Church History, which adds the following distinctives. So now we're going to see even more things that people have noticed about the Baptists through the years. The 17th point, the authority of the scriptures. Anabaptists held the Bible to be the only authority in matters of faith and practice. An interesting question is, which Bible? Now, the Valdenses translated the Bible into the Romance and Teutonic languages early in the 13th century. The Baptists retained these versions of the Bible 200 years after Luther's version. The oldest German Bible is of Baptist origin, and that comes from J.D. Christian, page 91. This German Bible is the Tepl version, the T-E-P-L version, from the 14th century. These Valdensian Bibles were directly related to the ancient Old Latin translation from 150 AD. Now, just take careful note. We're talking about the Old Latin translation, very, very different to the Latin Vulgate, which is a perverted translation, and marked the living stream whereby God preserved his pure word. If they were alive today, and the Baptists are alive today, of course, but today they would be known as the King James Version only if they were English-speaking people. People of other languages have the preserved word of God in their language. But we, as English-speaking people, have the authorized version of the King James Version of the Bible as the preserved word of God because we are English-speaking. And 18th point, salvation through the blood of Christ. Gerald, Gerald rightly notes that. This demonstrates that they were not universalists or unitarians, since there can be no human blood atonement for sin, they certainly were sound, doctrinally sound, on the deity of Christ. And the 19th point, missions. The Anabaptists sent forth a multitude of missionaries, according to W. W. Everts, as cited by Gerald, which we mentioned earlier, they were the most determined colporteurs and missionaries throughout Europe. To the Anabaptists, the religious life was to be an active, even aggressive discipleship. One feature of this mission outreach was the mass baptisms. At Münster in 1534, there were 1,400 baptisms in a week, and at times nearly whole villages would be baptized in one ceremony. This comes from Anderson, page 50. Thus, the Anabaptists were soul winning. They were aggressively soul winning and missionary sending um, communities. And 20, in addition to the above, they also believed in the sin nature of all men, the security of infants. By that we mean that if an infant were to die, they would go to heaven because they haven't had the opportunity to choose for God or for the devil yet. So the security of infants, strict church discipline, and the right of each church to select its own pastor. Amen. Local church autonomy. Do you agree 
that we should follow these tenets in our own church, the church of abundance. We are, after all, independent Baptists, or as the Catholics used to call us, Anabaptists. We are Baptists, but we're independent. And because we're independent, we, we don't have the problem of other religious bodies forcing us to apostatize our faith. We, we can keep our faith. It's up to us. Martin Luther signed the death penalty for Anabaptists. And yes, you did hear right. The Protestants sought to reform Rome using the Bible, but the Baptists sought to replace Rome with the Bible. Although initially, initially supportive of what the reformers were doing, the Baptists soon despaired of the course of events and quickly found themselves as the enemy. They became the enemy of the Protestants. Before long, Baptists were facing persecution from two quarters, the Catholics and the Protestants. The Diet of Speyer, okay, Diet, it's a word that used to be used for conferences, the Diet of Speyer, which is a Lutheran diet, in 1529 decreed the death penalty for Anabaptists. In 1536, Martin Luther signed a memorandum written by Melanchthon, which was his right-hand man, Melanchthon, assenting to the death penalty for Anabaptists. Only the Lutheran Prince Philip, the landgrave of Hesse, refused to kill Anabaptists. He was a true libertarian, and his lands provided haven for many Baptists. It was Zwingli's angry outburst. Let those who talk of going under go under indeed, which gave rise to the method of death by drowning of Anabaptists. Frustrated by his early debates with the Anabaptist leaders, Zwingli and the Swiss authorities became unmerciful in their extermination of Baptists and great numbers of them perished. Those that escaped fled to regions of relative safety. Moravia, the Netherlands, and areas all along the Rhine River. John Calvin, or also a great reformist, the father of the Protestant churches, was a despiser of Baptists or Anabaptists. By 1535, the Anabaptist movement in Switzerland had been overcome. John Calvin was a despiser of Anabaptists who advised that Anabaptists and reactionists should alike be put to death. The influx of Valdensian believers that made the Netherlands one of the most liberal areas of Reformation Europe. All kinds of beliefs were tolerated there, but up to 1533, the Anabaptists were also often called Mennonites in Holland and some other Germanic countries were the most prolific. From 1555, Jesuit intrigue brought the Inquisition to Holland, and the Duke of Alva desolated the country from 1567 to 1573. Great atrocities were committed against Calvinists and Anabaptists alike. William of Orange was the one who saved Holland, and the union of Altracht proclaimed that every individual should remain free in his religion and that no one man should be molested or questioned on the subject of divine worship. This was the result of the Baptistic heritage in the Dutch Republic. In Austria, Anabaptists were burnt 
and drowned by order of the Emperor Ferdinand I of Austria, many Anabaptists were burnt and drowned in this country. Despite the most awful sentences of torture and death, churches continued to grow throughout Austria and Hungary. Jacob Hutter was burned at the stake in Innsbruck in 1536, and the baton fell to Hans Mandler, who courageously carried on the great work of the Lord there. Balthazar Habmeyer published a tract in 1524 which said, the burning of heretics cannot be justified by the scripture. Amen. Christ himself teaches that the tars should be allowed to grow with the wheat. He did not come to burn or to murder, but to give life, and that more abundantly. We should therefore pray and hope for improvement in men as long as they live. If they cannot be convinced by appeals to reason or the word of God, they should be let alone. One cannot be made to see his errors by fire or sword. Hubmeyer prepared a catechism for those who were to be baptized in water, and he expressed his belief that Christianity will never truly prosper unless baptism is restored to its original purity, and that is from the historian Armitage. In conclusion, the Catholic Church has been persecuted, persecuting, torturing, and murdering Baptists for the past 1,700 years, and the first 300 years that was done by the the Roman government until the Holy Roman Empire took over. We have had no friends back then as Baptists, and definitely not with the harlot offspring, the Protestants either. Luther, that's Martin Luther, consented to the death penalty for all Anabaptists or Baptists in 1536. Zwingli promoted drowning of Baptists or Anabaptists. Calvin said that Anabaptists and reactionists should alike be put to death. And there I've just mentioned the three key pillars of the Protestant church. It is plain to see that the Anabaptists were of a pre-Reformation heritage and ultimately go back to the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Baptist heritage is one of names of derision. They were called Christians, as in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26. Amen. We were called Christians in the Bible. Montanists, Novatians, Donatists, Paulicians, Albigenses, Valdenses, Anabaptists, and today, we are called Baptists. But we are Christians. We are Bible-believing Christians. And that comes from J.T. Christian. We as Baptists are not Protestants. We're not Reformed or something new that arose in the 16th or 17th century. We as Baptists are an ancient people following the precepts of the Lord in a trail of blood that leads from the time of Christ's earthly ministry down through the ages until today. That is our Baptist heritage. In our case, we are independent Baptists. No church organization can require us to compromise our faith. Because we don't belong to a church organization, we are independent Baptists. Now that brings us to the end of our survey of the Baptists for today. Father God, I just thank you for this 
beautiful study that you gave us the opportunity to do today to look at the history of the Baptists all the way back from when you walked on this earth and before you died on the cross. We were there and all through the years, through a, a trail of blood, through the centuries, through thousands of years to today. And we still here. And we just thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now for the announcements. Join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Just go to abundance.online.church at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Or go to Church of Abundance. It's one word, churchofabundance.za.org. You notice the ZA comes first and then the .org. Churchofabundance.za.org. All the details about our meetings and much more is on the site. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity today. We just pray that the studies that we've done on the Baptists throughout the millennia, will something, something of it will sit in our hearts. And we just pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to speak to our hearts, that as we go through the week and coming months, that we'll become closer and closer to you as we realize what a privilege it is to be a Bible-believing Christian to be a Baptist, an independent Baptist. And I just pray that those people who tuned into this, this, this lecture today or this talk about Anabaptists, that they will be blessed. In the weeks that come, that come, you will bless them. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And we're now going to play out with a beautiful piece of music, Oh, Holy Night by John Sayles. It's a creative commons license. Oh, holy night. <laughs> 